Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. I think I've talked on here before about my interest in recovering certain forgotten teachings of the church, things which perhaps, you know, 150 years ago would have been more currently uh, known about and understood, but in the past several decades at least have have been largely uh, ignored or not repeated. Uh, so there's a sense among some uh, who have heard of them that they're no longer valid, which of course is not the case, uh, and many, a great, much greater number of people simply haven't heard of them at all. Uh, the simplest way I can put the topic of today's episode is in uh, Vatican II's Declaration on Religious Liberty, Dignitatis Humanae, uh, there's a little bit where it says, nothing in this document uh, invalidates previous Catholic teachings on the relationship between church and state, the rights of the church, etc. It doesn't mention what those teachings are, but it says that they're still authoritative. Uh, very few people bother to go and find out what those are, and that's what we're going to do today, essentially. So, uh, specifically, we're going to look at a couple of encyclicals uh, by Pope Leo XIII, primarily Immortale Dei, but also Libertas, and uh, this is in conjunction with a release on our sister podcast, Catholic Culture Audiobooks, of an unabridged audiobook recording of Leo XIII's Immortale Day, which will be released the same day as this episode. Uh, all I'll say other than that is put on your uh, docility trousers because this may be difficult uh, for many of us, unless you're a, a Spaniard of a certain sort, perhaps. Uh, so uh, let's let's all uh, go on this journey of uh, becoming more Catholic in our in our thinking together. It's always uh, always challenging, but always exciting. I've been looking forward to this episode for a while, and I've also been looking forward to uh, the guest who's going to be helping me or, me here uh, for some time. Been looking for an excuse to have him on. His name is Thomas Pink. He's a professor of philosophy at King's College London. Uh, has written a lot on uh, free will, as I understand it recently, in the area of philosophy. But uh, in the area of church teaching, I've read a number of quite interesting things he's written on on the church's teaching on religious liberty, the theology of baptism, and other topics. Uh, so, Thomas, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Thank you, Thomas. So, uh, today we're talking about, as I said, Immortale Dei, uh, Leo XIII's encyclical on the Christian Constitution of States, uh, published on November 1st, 1885. Uh, perhaps we can just start off uh, with a little bit of the context for uh, this encyclical, P perhaps both uh, the specific historical context, but also its situation uh, more widely with, with uh, Catholic social teaching of the time. Leo XIII is issuing this encyclical about seven or so years after he'd, or eight years after he'd become Pope. Um, it's an encyclical that comes after the end of papal temporal rule in the papal states in central Italy. So it's, it's about 15 years after Italian unification is more or less completed. Um, and it's written by someone who'd been uh, brought up uh, in the earlier part of the 19th century in an Italian noble family with clerical connections. He'd been educated by the Jesuits and he had uh, uh, become a secular uh, priest, but uh, been involved in the rule uh, government of the Papal States before eventually becoming Archbishop of Perugia. So he's very much part of Pius IX's church, and he will refer back with approval, uh, uh, complete approval, to teachings both of Pius IX and Gregory the Sixteenth. But he's writing this, this encyclical after the end of the Papal States, at a time where uh, political states in, in Europe and in large other parts of the world, the formerly Catholic world, are secularising. And um, in some cases, as in Italy, uh, they have governments that are quite hostile in many ways to the church. Um, 
and he's under no illusions as to uh, it still being the Middle Ages. He certainly realises he's, he's living in modernity, but he's addressing uh, immediately the Catholic bishops to recommend to them as an account of the Christian constitution of states, a model of church-state relations that goes back to the Middle Ages, that he sees actually as having flourished before the Reformation. So he's quite a complex character. He's both looking at the present, but also looking backward. And we'll see why he's doing that. But he makes certain moves in this encyclical that become very important in the 20th century. So uh, both Jacques Maritain and John Courtney Murray, who worked to prepare the ground before Vatican II for Dignitatis Humanae, the uh, Declaration on Religious Liberty, both knew uh, Leo XIII's work and in various ways tried to appropriate him to their particular conception of how religious liberty should be understood. And we'll see that he's actually invoked by the drafting commission at Vatican II. Um, one of the interesting features of the post-conciliar period is that since Vatican II, even quite conservative Catholics tend to distance them, distance their understanding of Dignitatis Humanae from Leo XIII. You'll get people like Martin Ronheimer, or I think it's fair to say to an extent, we'll come back to this, Joseph Ratzinger, who tend to be uh, rather dismissive of 19th century papal teaching and see Vatican II as corrective of it. Um, at Vatican II, they're much more cautious about saying that. We'll, 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 we'll see why that is. Okay, this, this, this encyclical on the Christian constitution of states is linked to another one that comes out three years later called Libertas, on freedom, on the nature of liberty. And the reason I'm going to consider them together is that um, Leo XIII is warning Catholics of an enemy. This enemy he often refers to as liberals. Um, uh, now, who are these liberals? They are people who misunderstand political authority because they fundamentally misunderstand liberty. So you can look at the you, you can look at Immortality Day as immediately a political argument, which then leads on to a more fundamental argument in Libertas on the nature of liberty. So uh, can you just uh, give us maybe a very, very quick rundown of the major points covered in Immortale Dei, uh, and if you wish, uh, Libertas as well, before we dive into uh, uh, some of the most important ones here? Well, fundamental thing we have to do, according to Leo XIII, is to distinguish between liberty and license, or true and false liberty. Hmm. True liberty takes us to truth and goodness. Licence takes us away from truth and goodness into evil. Both involve using our free will, but licence involves a misuse of free will. And the people that confuse liberty with licence get political authority wrong. They don't understand that political authority fundamentally comes from God. Mm. They think that political authority comes from the will of the individual. So we all collectively gather together uh, as possessors of personal freedom, unconstrained as yet by any law, and we sort of erect the state as the... Uh, a servant of our individual wills, as the will of the wills of the multitude. It's a bit like Locke or, 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 or 17th century contractarianism, sort of, um, um, without God. Um, Yves Simone, uh, the, the disciple of Maritain, Yves Simone, refers to this as the taxi driver theory of authority. Yeah. Uh, that, that these people believe that uh, authority 
is not something that sort of becomes distinct from you once you appoint it. He agrees that it is delegated by the people, but uh, he does not agree that 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 delegation is simply, you know, it's like a taxi driver. Uh, he's completely your your servant and you only have to go with him so far as you want to. Uh, he thinks that authority has stronger claims on you once it's been instituted uh, than that. Abs absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, it's not just like hiring a protection agency, which then does your bidding. Uh, uh, um, it's actually the political authority, like all authority, ultimately um, comes from divine authority. Because you really don't have in human life, the authority to tell other human beings what to do and right. impose obligations on them the way the state does, just as humans. It's got, that authority has got to come from a higher being, which is God. When I was a libertarian, uh, you know, many, many libertarians would, would make this exact argument. In other words, modern uh, government is predicated on the idea uh, that, well, we're simply governing ourselves by proxy. Uh, and uh, a libertarian then says, well, OK, I don't have the right to do this to others. So then how can I possibly delegate to the state uh, the right to do this? Uh, so, so uh, you know, the, the medieval Catholic conception does involve a certain type of popular sovereignty where the people as a whole uh, must consent uh, to authority, but it's not simply from the bottom up and it's not simply, uh, you know, any given individual's desires. Uh, and ultimately that authority comes from God, even if it is uh, uh, bestowed on, upon a particular uh, individual or group uh, by the people. So, so you, you sort of avoid that internal problem if you reject the, the modern idea of authority altogether. Uh, that, that leaves that hole open for an anarchist, essentially, to say, well, I didn't consent to this, uh, and, and, I, and not only did I not consent to this, but I don't have a right to, 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 to do these things to others, uh, whether on my own or through a proxy. Yeah. So we'll come back to the mechanism. Um of how political authority gets from God to, I don't know, President Trump or Boris Johnson, uh, whoever's immediately exercising it. Uh, that's an interesting question. But you're absolutely right. It's not, it's not a source in the individual will and then transferred to an agent of the individual will story at all in this tradition. It's, it's fundamentally a story about uh, humans exercising an authority given to them by their creator God. Um, and, but it's also another, another part of the story, which is going to be very important, is about what bears authority. Now, um, nowadays we talk about state political authority and, uh, when, and we immediately think of things like force and coercion. Because what states do is that uh, they issue directives and they back those directives up with threats of punishment. Uh, you know, even if you weren't public spirited, you'd still pay your taxes because you know that your goods would be seized and you'd be put in jail if you didn't. Um, so coercion sounds a horrid word, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a legal term, very much part of the Catholic legal tradition, as actually in the secular world it's also used. And it means issuing directives and then backing those directives up with threats of punishment. <clears throat> the sorts of punishments that ill-willed people who might not otherwise be willing to obey the law might reasonably fear. They're obviously designed to motivate the, even the ill-willed to do what they're told. So there's the directive side to authority, which is the issue of the instructions. And then there's the coercive side to the authority, which is the threat of the sanctions or punishments, the bad things. And we tend to assume that the one authority that can do that, in a sovereign way at any rate, is the state. Mm -hmm. It's got the monopoly of legitimate force. And um, uh, it's very important to Leo XIII that he doesn't think this. Um, and this actually is a very important feature. He thinks that there are two kinds of sovereign uh, coercive authority. There is the state, 
That's one, to use the Latin phrase, potestas. Again, it's a technical term. It means a bearer of coercive authority, particularly a sovereign mm. one. Uh, there's, the, there's the state, the publica potestas, public power, but there's also the church, the ecclesial potestas. And that's a potestas too. The church is as much a coercive authority as the state. Um, John Courtney Murray didn't actually think this. About the time of Vatican II, Courtney Murray says, if an authority exists that is empowered to restrain men from public action in accord with their religious beliefs, a bit of religious coercion, this authority can reside only in government, which presides over the juridical and social order. Well, a very mm. important thing about, about uh, Leo XIII is he, he would have disagreed with Courtney Murray and did so. He thought the church could restrain men from public action in accord with their religious beliefs, because in relation to religion, it was actually the church that presided over the juridical order. We'll come back to that. So we've got a, a, a theory of two coercive powers, potestates, one of which is the church. Um, again, like any other coercive authority, its authority comes from God. So both church and state are powers, potestates, directly in different ways, but still directly instituted by God. Um, and this is not what modern, a lot of modern Catholics think. It's certainly not what secular people think. It's going to be very important that at Vatican II, the drafting commission, the commission that drafts Dignitas Humanae, endorses Leo XIII's claim that the church is a potestas and uses it to explain the declaration. So, so this, it's, this... It's... Go ahead. Sorry. So... Not only are these two powers existing, but the, the fundamental of the Christian constitution of states is that the two powers should essentially coexist in a unity, an ordered unity. And an important part of the... And when you say unity, that, you don't mean... Uh, when you say unity, uh, it doesn't mean in the sense that there's no distinction between the two, but in the, in the sense that there is a, a harmony of will, uh, yes. uh, essentially. They, they, they compose together a wider Christian community in any country where there is a Christian state and the Catholic right. Church. But obviously they're distinct from each other. They have distinct, as we'll see, distinct forms of authority. Yes. Uh, and they have well, this, That's what makes it different from a theocracy, isn't it, right? Ab absolutely. So that there's going to be much of human life the Church has no direct authority, legislative authority over. So both Church and state are on the business of making laws and backing those laws up with threats of punishment. But much of what goes on in human life is not subject to church legal authority. Right. The church can teach about it, um, but it can't directly pass a law. So it could, it could say that certain contracts in, in its view and uh, her view are immoral, but if it's just day-to-day -day commercial contracts, she has no authority of her own to change contract law. That's the state. I she may admonish yeah, the state. Yeah, so that, that's, that's important to say for some people who might get overexcited in a kind of a reactionary yeah. approach to this topic um, and kind of want, want the church to be directly, you know, ruling over all, all temporal affairs. That's, that's not what Leo is saying here. Absolutely um, not. So there, there are two powers, each of which is sovereign in its sphere. That's very, very important. So this idea... Um, he, he starts out talking about God as the source of government authority. Um, and uh, this is very important uh, for what follows about the obligations of the state towards religion. Uh, but it's, you know, it's very interesting. So he, he's about, we're about to get into his, his uh, argument for why the state must profess the true religion. But, you know, it's kind of interesting that, uh, and, and I'm in favor of the, um, you know, the United States Constitution. I think there's many, uh, on the whole, I think there's many uh, positive things about our founding. But I think that many Catholics here um, th indeed think that, uh, you know, the state has an obligation to recognize that its authority comes from God. But it is the kind of uh, neutral God uh, which does not profess any particular religion. It, it is only the God, uh, you know, at most that can be known by reason. 
and and perhaps even a minimal, minimalist version of that, that, that the state really uh, needs to recognize for a healthy social order. But Leo uh, goes beyond that. I, I would like to uh, read a little bit because this will be such a contentious point. I would like to read the, there are a number of passages here. Um, I, I don't know how much of it I'll read, but uh, he's just been talking about this, the, the uh, authority of the civil power coming from God and the the duty of obedience to rulers. This is in Immortale Dei. Uh, so uh, he's clearly not just talking about uh, uh, civil society as a whole, but civil society as, as ruled by the state specifically. He says, as a consequence, the state constituted as it is, is clearly bound to act up to the manifold and weighty duties linking it to God by the public profession of religion. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, to go a little bit further here in the quote, skip over a little bit. Uh, since no one is allowed to be remiss in the service due to God, and since the chief duty of all men is to cling to religion in both its teaching and practice, not such religion as they may have a preference for, but the religion which God enjoins, and which certain and most clear marks show to the be only show to be the only one true religion, it is a public crime to act as though there were no God. So, too, is it a sin for the state not to have care for religion as something beyond its scope or as of no practical benefit, or out of many forms of religion to adopt that one which chimes in with the fancy, for we are bound absolutely to worship God in that way which he has shown to be his will. All who rule, therefore, would hold in honor the holy name of God, and one of their chief Duties must be to favor religion, to protect it, to shield it under the credit and sanction of the laws, and neither to organize nor enact any measure that may compromise its safety. This is the bounden duty of rulers to the people over whom they rule. So this is essentially uh, the, the core of his teaching about the state's duties toward, towards religion. And later on, he also argues uh, ag against uh, treating all religion uh, putting all religious uh, sects on, on the same ground as the one true religion. Uh, so we, we can get into the details of that, but I wanted to just quote directly uh, so people can hear Leo's own words there. Absolutely. And, and, and in fact, in, um, <coughs> particularly in Libertas, he specifically attacks people who think that the state's duties towards God are limited to... Uh, what can be known through reason alone and just the content of the natural law. Um, he says, once you realise the state's authority is based on God, you can't suddenly stop attending to divine authority just because it's being communicated to you through revelation as opposed to reason. It's right. still being communicated to you. And insofar as you have uh, a, an obedient attitude towards God, which you better have, because that's where your authority comes from, O state, you can't switch it off just because we've got a bit of revelation suddenly, provided the revelation is clearly delivered. So uh, you've got actually to recognise revealed religion as well as natural religion. And it's inconsistent to do one without the other. So he specifically addresses that uh, 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 we will have in God we trust, but but we'll leave the revealed bit to private life. Yes, uh, because a Maritan or a John Courtney Murray would certainly have believed that the state, you know, should recognize. Uh, I, I believe they would have believed. Uh, I know Maritan would have believed that the uh, yeah. the state should recognize, you know, the source of its authority in God, and uh, but uh, but they somehow believe that this could function in practice somehow without any real need uh, for uh, the state to officially recognize and favor uh, the one true religion above others. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back to say a little more about why it's so important for the state to be specifically Christian. But there is that fundamental case uh, that uh, Leo returns to, which is that um, the state must recognise the true basis of its authority and therefore obey God, uh, however he communicates his will. Um, and he's very, very, very clear that revelation isn't something that you just whispered in the night, which is a bit dubious. A lot, again, a lot of modern people tend to think, oh, revelation, that's, that's, 
that's kind of you know it's a bit like a a dodgy a dodgy radio signal in the mountains yeah uh he, he's constantly saying it's clear what the true revelation is we've got the prophets we've got uh, miracles of right. christ we've got etc etc so you've got no business uh, uh pretending you haven't heard in the public sphere. the modern attitude is that you know at best uh, you know, the act of faith requires, you know, this almost he heroic, superhuman, uh, you know, leap. Uh, and of course, I mean, it is, it actually is superhuman, but they, they act as though um, it's, it's, it's nigh impossible uh, to come to conclusions about what the true religion is. Uh, and, and Leo pushes back against this. Now, of course, it may have been easier. There have may, may have been less, fewer impediments to this in Leo's time than in ours, and I think we can recognize that. But nonetheless, uh, if uh, if individuals are uh, obligated to recognize the true religion uh, and aren't simply going to be let off the hook, um, you know, uh, save for serious impediments, uh, neither neither are states in this matter. But he follows up with this caveat, though, which I think is is good to have. That uh, he says the church says it's unlawful to place the various forms of divine worship on the same footing as the true religion, as I just mentioned. But he says, "quote does not on that account condemn those rulers who, for the sake of securing some great good or of hindering some great evil, allow patiently custom or usage to be a kind of sanction for each kind of religion having its place in the state. And in fact, the churches want to take earnest heed that no one shall be forced to embrace the Catholic faith against his will. Uh, so that's that's worth saying that uh, he, he doesn't believe that... Uh, Every circumstance is every circumstance is going to be the same, as far as uh, the footing on which the state places various religions, the degree to which the state uh, explicitly recognizes the Catholic faith. Um, but it's very clear that uh, you know religious pluralism or uh, you know a non-confessional state cannot be the ideal it, it's very clear that that there is an obligation even if tempered by various concerns uh, of the common good in various situations for the state to explicitly recognize the true religion yes and i think here we come to what will again be an issue at vatican ii because there are two ways in which you can understand limits to legitimate, the legitimate use of coercive law to support religious truth. There is uh, a story that appeals to prudence, uh, and I don't mean just uh, narrow prudence, but moral prudence, uh, and a balancing of good and against evil. Um, and, and Leo is clearly telling that story. So, for example, if you've got an historic a uh, combination of religious populations in your country, uh, it is absolutely a duty on you out of prudence to uh, uh, um, respect that fact and not go around like a bull in a china shop uh, trying to undo history. Um, but there's also another story, and, that, and, and that's associated with ideas of toleration. Well, I mean, he, Leo will say things like, it'd be much better if we weren't in a situation where there was religious pluralism in the population. But there we are. And so that we, we must tolerate this. But there's also a story which isn't entirely absent from Leo, but which is, of course, central to Dignitatis Humanae Vatican II, which appeals to a right to liberty, a right of an individual not to be coerced not to be subject to directives backed by threats of punishment. Um, and here we're not talking about a prudent calculation of consequences. We're talking about a normative barrier that's mm. fairly unconditional uh, coming from someone's moral standing. And that story again is in Leo. It's actually in that, that, that bit about how we don't impose the faith on people against their will. Yes. He doesn't use the word right there, but I think he's got a right story at the back of his mind because that's part of the canonical tradition. At the beginning of every episode, I always say 
that this podcast is a production of catholicculture.org. And that's because Catholic Culture is a much bigger apostolate than just our podcasts. We offer so many resources, Catholic news and commentary, resources for living the liturgical year, a massive and ever-growing library of Catholic reference material free of charge. Astonishingly, we end up reaching tens of millions of Catholics and potential converts every year, and part of that is because we allow others to reuse our material free of charge. It's widely used in social media, reprinted on other websites, used in television and radio programs. My own podcast is rebroadcast by a Catholic radio station in Texas, and we don't charge them anything to do that. Our articles reappear in print media, magazines, newspapers, parish bulletins. I've personally met priests who say that they use our material for catechesis and for inspiration for homilies. And this is really an international thing because we get plenty of emails from priests in places like India and Africa who use our material for catechesis. Now, Catholic Culture is a nonprofit and we run almost entirely on donations. As you can imagine, every year there's sort of a question, okay, are we going to be able to keep going next year? Especially right now, we are struggling financially because our income was down about 25% during the summer of the pandemic, and we lost quite a lot of monthly pledges from people who had been hurt economically. And so it is time for our 2020 Fall Challenge campaign. Thankfully, a generous donor has offered a matching grant of $100,000, which means, well, it's self-explanatory, all of your gifts between now and December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, will be matched. If you'd like to help keep this and our other three podcasts going, please go to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. And if you can't donate, or even if you can, please also keep us in your prayers. We depend on those as much as on financial support. And as I've said many times, we pray for all of our listeners, donors, all of our users every day. Thank you and God bless you. He illustrates this specifically within a quote from Augustine, man cannot believe otherwise than of his own will. Uh, So also it's simply a matter of the way that faith, the act of faith works as well. Well, Yes, but again, one's got to be a bit careful there because um, we might come back to this. There is a a crime of heresy in the church, canon law. Right. Um, So that if you obstinately uh, uh, fail to believe something solemnly taught as binding doctrine on you by the church and express this disbelief in the external forum, you can be guilty of a crime. Right. And This is for punished. those who are already uh, under the jurisdiction of the church. If as, once you're baptized, absolutely, because you can't be uh, commit the crime of heresy unless you're baptized. And I mean, this, this again is addressed um, at the Council of Trent in session seven, canon 14, of the uh, decree in baptism, uh, where canon baptism, where uh, they condemn Erasmus's view that baptized people who are unwilling to uh, um, uh, live within the church uh, shouldn't be compelled back into the church except through being deprived of the sacraments. They shouldn't just be excommunicated. They 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 should pro- they can properly be subject to coercive pressure to get them to uh, recover the faith to which they're committed by baptism. Now, this is really difficult. This is really alien to modern Catholics. Mm-hmm. It's, it seems to actually go against the idea that the act of faith is essentially free. It seems to be that the act of faith is uncoercible only in the unbaptized. So what is going on? Um, bear in mind that this canon of Trent is a seminary manual platitude until the Second Vatican Council. I give you a list of seminary manuals and commentaries in which people say, this is de fide. Uh, the faith can be imposed on baptized heretics and apostates. Um, again, Leo is, 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 not, is, is not really addressing the detail of this, but he's clearly taking on board the thought that uh, if you're sufficiently outside the faith, you can't be forced, have it forcibly imposed on you. Um, and this creates a very, very deep problem about the 
uh, moral significance of the act of faith and its relationship to law, which I think is as yet unsolved in the church and is certainly not addressed by Dignitas Simone. Uh, but it, it involves dogmatic teaching in the past, which is at least as solemn as anything said by any 19th century pope. I mean, Canon 14, Session 7. Or by Vatican II, for that matter. Oh, yeah. Canon 7, uh, sorry, Canon 14, Session 7 is generally regarded as de fide uh, in the manuals without any, any discussion. Um, and, you know, as I say, there's a, it's, it's a platitude. Immediately after Vatican II, it just goes it disappears. It's like yeah. it's like somebody in a Stalinist photograph who was allied to Trotsky. It just goes. Um, well, I think that would most... be a great. Uh, I think that would be a great subject for a, a whole separate episode, especially yeah, dealing not, with all the. the it's, it's not central uh, to this, but I think that. I think I think um, uh, it's important. Yeah, as long as we're uh, challenging people, we may as well. Uh, <laughs> so uh, okay, so so we got this. On one hand, we've got the idea of toleration. And then the other, we've got the, no, you can't curse people, not because it would be imprudent uh, or disturbing to the peace of, of, of the political community or morally objectionable in those ways, but because the person you're attempting to curse has a right not to be treated that way. Uh, because of their human dignity, uh, to use Dignitas Simone's ter terminology, I think in the past people might have said because they bear the image of God and they possess free will, which is the basis of a right to liberty. That's what Suarez at the Counter-Reformation would have said. But there is this idea of a right, and it's not an invention of Vatican II. It goes right back in the tradition. It's not being emphasised as much by Leo XIII as the toleration issue is. And... Uh, whereas, of course, the Dignitas Humanae is all about a right that not to be religiously coerced. We'll come back to that. Uh, Leo moves on. He, he does t touch uh, briefly. You mentioned at the beginning uh, the the history of debates over and, and uh, literal uh, conflicts over the temporal power of the church and the fall of the papal states uh, prior to Leo's papacy. Um, he does touch on this very briefly. Uh, he says, All ought to hold that it was not without a singular disp disposition of God's providence that this power of the church was provided with a civil sovereignty as the surest safeguard of her independence. Which is, uh, it makes me laugh because that, that, that sort of roundabout language is so uh, typical of some of these, uh, you know, something like the syllabus of errors, for example. It's got like a negative in there. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's... Uh, it actually allows quite a bit of wiggle room as to what exactly, you know, what degree of, you know, temporal uh, uh, state the church should hold. Um, but at the very least, it, you know, it, it, it says, you know, that the church must basically have some, some uh, fief in this world to safeguard its independence. So at least something like today's Vatican City, if not something uh, like an empire or as, as, uh, as vast as the papal states, uh, but but to those who nowadays there have actually just very recently been a couple of articles by American writers uh, celebrating the fall of the papal states as something that was a wonderful springtime of spirituality for the church. And you know uh, we can debate uh, you know matters of providence and and historical contingency uh, all day, but you know let's let's be a little bit slow to to celebrate uh, you know. The, the the resting the illegitimate resting of uh, of power from the Pope by anti-Catholic forces uh, and and here Pope Leo clearly says uh, it was not without a single singular disposition of God's providence that the Church had this uh, civil sovereignty. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's important though to emphasize that the main subject of Immortality Day is precisely about. A temporal sovereignty not belonging to the church, i.e., that of your average state, and right. and it's it is important that there are these two quite distinct forms of sovereignty. If the church needs a little bit of direct temporal sovereignty of its own, that's going to be a further story. Uh, the main story right. is about its spiritual sovereignty, how it takes the form of coercive potestas for religious ends, and why it needs to be allied to a distinct kind of. Uh, potestas involving sovereignty belonging to uh, something that's not the church at all, it's just the state, the ordinary state. So, so uh, he, he, he touches here upon the limits of the powers, which you mentioned, each has its own 
distinct sphere ruling over the same subjects in many respects, but but uh, sorry, the same subjects in in different respects for the most part. Um, but uh, he, here he gets to this idea, this 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 metaphor for the relationship between the church and the state, uh, one which twentieth uh, century Catholic thinkers would would propose an alternative to uh, that this church is to the state as the soul is to the body. Can you tease out the implications of this metaphor? Right. It's, it's a really ancient and quite complex idea, this idea of church-state union or church-state harmony as a kind of an out, built on analogy with soul-body union in, in, in the human self, union between soul, body and the human self with the church as soul and the state as body. And what, what, what does it mean and what are its implications and why, why is Leo using it? And I think to see that, we've got to look again at these two potestates, these two coercive authorities and what separates them. They, um, Leo, as part of seeing all authority coming from God, is very, very concerned that... Uh, the two divinely instituted forms of authority must be able to coexist in harmony. If you've got two forms of authority, both directly coming from God, in different ways, but both coming from God, divinely instituted, it's got to be possible, for, and they both exist for the, for, for the good of human beings, and they may even have the same subjects, or same, you know, the, the, the baptised member of the church may also be the citizen of a state, it must be possible for them to work in harmony. And I think that's not an idea that's gone away. I think I think if, if Catholics are going to think sensibly about church and state and accept what I think is fairly doctrinal, that the authority of the state as well as the authority of the church is God-given, um, you can go and look at St Paul for stuff along those lines, um, you've got to have a harmony between the two. And it's going to have to be an ordered harmony because... Uh, one of the things that Leo is very hot on is the fact that the universe contains order from higher to lower, uh, with God obviously at the top. And harmony must it, it respect this order. There must be a proper subordination of lower to higher. Uh, while respecting the, the distinction and genuine sovereignty that might attach to the lower as well as the higher. So... Church and state are two powers. They both serve the human good. One is, in a sense, higher than the other because it's serving a higher good. So let's just look at these two potestates and look at what good they serve. <clears throat> the state looks after the good of this life. Okay. Supposing Christ had never come to save us. Supposing even that the fall of humanity had never occurred. It's an old thought in Catholic uh, political theory that we would still have had the state because we are a social animals and we can only flourish in an ordered community. And even if God didn't destine us for the uh, 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 beatific vision in heaven, he would still have created us to be happy as reasonable beings with free will on this earth. And our freedom, uh, living in a community, would need it to be directed by law, law which we'd have understood through our reason. And this law would have to be applied to deal with all the very complex situations that large populations have to deal with, large populations of finite creatures, all with needs that have to be satisfied together, like through traffic systems and the like. Uh, we can't, even without original sin, we'd still have to travel on a traffic system on the right side of the road. Uh, um, so... Uh, you're always going to need uh, a potestas for this life, which is the state. And of course, because we are fallen, because actually a lot of us aren't very nice at all, this uh, not only directive authority will have to exist, but it'll have to take coercive form as well. It'll have to be able to threaten punishments. And this state, uh, political state, takes us to a natural happiness of this life. But besides being fallen and something having to be done about that, and the state can't really address the fall on its own. It can't deal that much with our evil. It can issue threats uh, 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 and, and, and uh, uh, address our selfishness. But it certainly is not very good at making us less selfish on its own. 
uh, certainly not, not, it can't inform us with charity on its own. Um, so we need um, some other solution to this. And um, with this our solution comes a higher good, because besides sending us the church to save us from our fallen state, uh, the church, um, through its, her founder Christ, offers us a higher form of happiness that transcends our natural capacity, which is the beatific vision in heaven. What, what uh, Leo will refer to as the supernatural end. Frequently talks about uh, happiness on this earth as a natural end. And he would use the word civil order to pick it out, guarded by the civil order and the civil potestas. And then we have the supernatural because above nature, not because it spooks or anything like that, but supernatural because it's above nature, above natural capacity, a supernatural end of heaven, which the church uh, instituted um, uh, through Christ coming on this earth and founding it, um, that will take, the church will take us to that higher supreme end, which is obviously infinitely greater than the natural happiness of this life. So we've got two ends supernatural, natural, supernatural, obviously greatly above, natural. <clears throat> the loss of the supernatural end uh, um, is, is the thing really to worry about. Uh, um, uh, natural unhappiness is obviously very serious, but nothing compared to the loss of the supernatural end. Uh, that is the supreme one. Um, and that's the church's concern. So we, we want church and state to act together. So the state helps us get to our natural end and the church helps us to get to our supernatural end without some almighty clash. We don't want one issuing instructions one direction and the other issuing instructions in the other direction because that will lead to, at the very least, a lot of natural unhappiness that could be avoided. And in fact, Leo says there's got to be a harmony between these two institutions, church and state, such that they actually, although they each have their own job, they each help the other do its job better. And you've uh, written about Maritain proposing an alternative analogy, where as opposed to the soul and the body, uh, the church is to the state as grace is to nature. Now, given what you've just been saying about the natural end versus the supernatural end, uh, what actually is the difference between those two analogies, briefly? I think uh, the difference has to do with what nature owes to grace and uh, what ne nature needs from grace. And both things are true. Um, we've already seen that Leo thinks that it's unreasonable and silly uh, for a kind of authority that um, uh, is based on divine authority and owes everything to divine authority to stop recognising divine authority, simply because it comes through revelation. Hmm. And he would say it's equally silly for it to stop being concerned with that other authority, simply because it addresses a higher end. Even more silly when you consider that the higher end is vastly more important than anything the state's worried about in its own area of competence. So the state can't just switch off because it's to do with grace, and that's another concern. But the other issue, um, which is very important, and I think Maritain tended to neglect, but which Leo the 13th is very hot on, which is this. Because we are fallen, nature can't look after itself. It's, it's not utterly corrupt, we're not Calvinists, but it's in bad trouble. And if you take political authority based on natural law and leave it detached from grace, if you leave it detached at a public level from the community of the church, it will degrade in the natural order. And it will stop recognising important areas of natural law. And then it will conflict with the church on the central issue of the natural law, which grace confirms and seeks to better enable us to keep as healing grace. And so you will, the 19th century popes predict, and, and Pius IX does this as well as Leo XIII, if you secularise the state and detach it from grace and from the church, it will degrade in the natural order and you will have very serious church-state conflict and the state will not do its job, will not do it very well. 
Yes. Yeah, so, so he gets into this sort of list of false principles that are condemned by him and, and previous popes, uh, such as, uh, I believe, Gregory uh, XVI. He cites uh, Mirari Vos specifically. He, he condemns this idea that, um, you know, everybody is absolutely equal in terms of authority, that no man has the right to rule over another. Uh, he condemns this, uh, this government as taxi driver idea. Um, he, uh, he condemns uh, this, and I'll, and I'll quote here again, because again, I think it really reinforces uh, what we've been saying. Uh, he, he says, uh, it's, it's a false principle uh, when the authority of God is passed over in silence by the state. I quote, Moreover, it believes that it is not obliged to make public profession of any religion or to inquire which of the very many religions is the only one true or to prefer one religion to all the rest or to show any form of religion special favor, but on the contrary is bound to grant, to grant equal rights to every creed so that public order may not be disturbed by any particular form of religious belief. Now, this just is the attitude of religion uh, of religious freedom favored by as as much as i hate to say it the, the founders of the united states um mm. they were coming from this situation where religious uh, understandable in many ways they were coming from a situation where religious wars had thrown europe into turmoil uh and all that and of course this is a, a serious scandal and a, a real a real spur for re liberalism historically um uh, but Leo nonetheless says that this this is wrong. Uh, this idea that uh, simply for uh, that in principle, for the sake of public order, uh, the state must grant equal rights to every creed. Um, and, uh, you know, again, he does make that concession earlier to the common good in certain circumstances of toleration as a concession, but uh, certainly not that that sort of in principle and generally speaking, this kind of... Um, Official indifference to to creeds uh, is a good thing, and he, and he's and he is not just sit, talking about you know Satanism or things that involve human sacrifice or something like that. He he is really talking yeah. about uh, only the true religion being specially favored by the state. Yeah. I think here here now we come to the nub of why he's interested in the soul body union model. Um, we've got the church concerned with directly with the supernatural end and has an authority specifically to make law for the supernatural end and for religion generally. Um, uh, even natural religion, the worship of God is actually within the church's sphere. Salvation and the worship, all the worship of God, just as the worship of God. So even if there had never been a supernatural end, we might still have had natural religion. doesn't matter. Now, anything to do with the worship of God just on its own is part of the church's authority, not the state's. Um, and on the other hand, we've got the state that's got a direct legislative authority in civil matters, like commercial law contracts, uh, like the law and murder, uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, things that might be very importantly to do with the natural law, but not specifically to do with the worship of God or the, 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 the move through the sacraments to salvation, that sort of supernatural religion. But he's also saying, look, if... If the sorry, no, if, go ahead. If the state should support the true religion, as you've just been saying, it should legally privilege the true, the true religion. And immediately the question is going to arise: but how can the state do that in civil law, when the state has no legislative competence of its own in matters of religion? Hmm. So he's repeatedly yeah. saying, right through Libertas and through Immortality Day that the state should favour the true religion because of the importance of salvation. But he's saying that it's the church that's the sovereign authority in matters to do with salvation. So how does the state get to do this? And that's where the soul body uh, union analogy becomes absolutely vital. It goes back to the patristic period in its various forms, but it becomes especially carefully worked out in the Jesuit theology of the Counter-Reformation, where they're very interested with the Reformation in church-state relations. And the thought is this. The state has no authority of its own in matters of religion. So, you know, Henry VIII 
and other Protestant rulers going in for undirected state activity in religious matters, you are very naughty. You should stop. Um, but the state uh, should still recognise the true religion, just as any private individual should. That doesn't give the state any special legislative authority in matters of religion, any more than your or my duty to recognise the true religion gives us legislative authority about matters of religion. Once the political, in fact, the political community as a whole should recognise religious truth and be baptised. And then we're all bound by our, in the political sphere, by our baptismal obligations, and immediately the rulers are bound by their baptismal obligations, to make their um, the coercive resource and legal resources of the state available to the church to help enforce her legislative authority over religion. It's the state should act in matters of religion as agent to the church's principle. So the state is still sovereign in civil matters, but in matters of religion, she should be a kind of the state. It should be a kind of agent. A phrase usually used in this connection is brachium seculari, secular arm. Right. The 1917 Code of Canon Law, which is still within this Leonine world, re refers to the state when it's acting on its own authority as civilis potestas, civil power. When it's acting to enforce ecclesiastical law, which it's required to do under Canon 2198, it's referred to as brachium seculari, secular arm. It's an agent. Let me ask really quick, uh, when Leo talks about the obligation of the state to uh, to profess the true religion, um, I, I heard one person say that, uh, well, you know, the uh, the word translated to, to mean state uh, really properly refers to civil society as a whole, but not necessarily to the rulers of civil society. Um, I think it's fairly clear in context that he is talking about rulers and laws and things like that yeah. as as representative of civil society. But do you have a, a quick response to make to that? Well, a number. Civitas in ecclesiastical Latin can mean state as well as civil society. Um, Courtney Murray used to criticise Leo XIII because he tended to assimilate civil society to the state. Uh, your... your uh, I think rather less linguistically uh, informed uh, person is 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 trying to reduce uh, uh, Leo's word for state to civil society. Uh, what is very clear in many passages is when he talks about societas uh, civilis uh, or civitas, he's really interested in its political organisation, and almost immediately every time he'll start talking about uh, the principes or the people who uh, rem publicant gerunt, who, who run, the, run, run the state. Um, and so he's interested in essentially a structure between two forms of coercive authority, not between the church and just general civil society of people living together outside state structures. Uh, otherwise, as you say, he wouldn't constantly be talking about uh, uh, potestas publica and the people that uh, run it in, in, in that context or right. um, lament the separation of church and state, uh, um, which he frequently does. Some people try to get around this by saying, well, of course, you know, rulers as individuals have an obligation to profess the true religion like everybody else. So, But this does not necessarily mean sort of officially via state apparatus or something like that. But my, I, I came up with a response to this, which I don't know, I think is good, uh, that, uh, you know, we say families uh, are supposed to worship God um, but but we don't sort of flatten the fam the structure of the family so that everybody is just worshiping God as an as an individual uh, with no differentiation between roles because that the father is the priest of the domestic church we all recognize this so so when yeah. he worships God with his family he is doing so not just as John a member of this uh, undifferentiated mass of four or five people uh, but he is doing this as the father of the family. Uh, in as as his role in this structure, and I would say the same uh, of those in any uh, in, in any any public office, according to uh, what that office is. So so he's but, doing but, so as an individual, and specifically according to the nature of the office and the state of life that he holds. But there's, there's an even more immediate way of, of contradicting these people, which is that he various times in Immortality Day and in Libertas, particularly clearly in Libertas, 
says that amongst the laws that states should enforce are revealed laws. Now, it's quite juridically impossible for a state to enforce through public law, revealed law, without accepting revelation as true. In yeah, I mean, this that, that, list of... Yeah, that's that's a great point. <laughs> yeah, you just uh, can't, I mean, you know, you can't you can't uh, enforce revealed law on the quiet without admitting a revelation on the basis of which it's law. Yeah, no, there's no getting around that. Um, in this list of errors that I was that I was going through, uh, he he talks about you know absolute freedom of speech and opinion, and I want to set that aside and address that later in our conversation as a separate uh, as a separate but related issue because it's a, f a fairly big one. Um, but uh, he he goes on to sort of what he thinks are the consequences of these errors, and you and you talked about yes the the, the state and church clashing over matters of natural law. So he he names a number of things which happened historically at the time, some of which have happened since then, some of them are not happening now as much as others, but he, he, he kind of goes into these consequences. States think they can disregard the church and do whatever they want. Okay, we can clearly see that uh, happening today. They forbid the church to instruct the people. Uh, there are definitely more movements towards that today, but we can see that clearly, for example, in American history as to uh, the uh, the the seizure of the rights of education, both from the church and the family uh, in, uh, I suppose it was the early 20th century, maybe the late 19th century. I think the early 20th century in the United States uh, for, for several decades, homeschooling was illegal. Uh, the, the, the pushing of public education was partially a measure against Catholic education. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's pretty amazing how reading the so early social documents of the church, even though it's not specifically about education, the rights of the family and uh, as the primary educators of the child and the rights of the church to instruct people in the faith are so constantly e emphasized. And, of course, Leo has his, uh, well, no, I suppose it's Pius the, the 11th, uh, Divini Ilius Magistri, uh, th this whole encyclical on, on this. Um but then he says something very interesting. He says they claim jurisdiction over Catholic marriages. And I think this is actually a great example of where clearly you have your own arguments, which I'm sure will come up. But uh, I think this is a great example of, of where if the church does not recognize the special rights of the Catholic church in a certain area, they will come to conflict because, because the state does not have jurisdiction over Catholic marriages, first of all. And secondly, uh, it can't all. It can't just grant grant the church jurisdiction over Catholic marriages, and then, uh, for equality's sake, grant every other religious group jurisdiction over their own marriages, because other religious groups do not have jurisdiction uh, over their own marriages in the same way that the church has jurisdiction over Catholic marriage uh, marriages. So you know, if a, if a Muslim uh, married couple becomes Catholic, the the state cannot then enforce uh, that jurisdiction or, or, or even recognize it or allow it to be enforced by private parties in the same way that it can with the Catholic Church. So there's a clear, I don't, I don't see any way of getting around this, this conflict without the state uh, recognizing the special uh, jurisdiction of the Catholic Church. I, 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 just, I agree. I, I think actually one could put the point um, in a more general way, as Leo does himself. And again, it comes back to the soul body union model, which I hadn't quite finished with, because it, it's used both to explain the principal agent relationship uh, between church and state in relation to religion, but also the importance of the harmony to the fundamental life of the state. Hmm. So um, the soul... And the body, and I think I think the soul body analogy, which you get in Suarez, you get in Bellamin, um, they mean the intellectual soul. Um, uh, the intellectual soul and the body have each have their own respective competencies. The body looks after the heart rate. I don't want to adjust my heart rate thing very much as, as the intellectual soul. I, I want my body to do that. On the other hand. Um, if I, but my concerns as an intellectual being are higher than those just of my body, which deals with my heart rate, they will concern with whether I should get that interesting book in the library. Um, 
And then I want my body, when I'm dealing with that intellectual matter, which is the and you know parallel with religion, I want my body to do my bidding and take me to the library so I can get that book. Um, that's what the soul body analogy is about. In intellectual matters, the body is the agent of the soul, just as in religious matters, the state is the agent of the church. But if you take the two apart, you kill you kill the body. Uh, we leave it unrecognisably different. And one of the points that Leo is saying is that once you separate church and state, you will not only not respect natural law, you will get a fundamentally a conception of political authority going that attaches it from divine authority, which you're clearly not attending to anymore, guys. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't have separated church and state. And then you will start seeing the state simply as the tool of individual wills. And then he says, you will get the state as uh, an object of tyranny that can be used by whatever set of wills are strongest, at most sheer punch. Yeah. Uh, so you can have the dictatorship of the majority that people like Tocqueville or John Stuart Mill worried about, or the dictatorship of people who've got the panzer divisions, uh, uh, or whatever. And there'll be no constraint on what they do at all, because it's now just a battle of will. Um, and if there's nothing going on in your immediate context, then who wins the election? And that's all that matters. Uh, again, it'll just be counting the votes. Whatever people are voting for, it doesn't matter. Uh, so Leo is actually quite favourable to democracy. He's, he makes it very clear he doesn't expect Catholic states to be monarchies. He's very happy for them to be democracies. But they must always recognise that the authority of the state ultimately comes from God, right. not human wills. And it must recognise uh, divine authority in its fully communicated form in a revealed religion. Yeah, he, he makes a point of saying the church, it's wrong to say that the church rejects modern modes of government um, uh, and, and even that it rejects uh, modern research or uh, insights into the functioning of a legitimate form of liberty in society and, and ways to prevent state overreach and things like that. He, he says that's, that's all good, you know, with, with the provisions that we've already given here about the relationship between the state and God, the state and the moral law and the state and the church. Um, so the, the, the final uh, big consequence he, he goes into here of these false ideas he's condemned is that the state rejects the special role and, and the rights of the church and, uh, f quote, for this reason possesses no right or any legal power of action save that which she holds by the concession and favor of the government, unquote. Um, so I, I think we can see that's clearly the case. So in the, in, in the U.S., you know, the state being the one to decide what counts as a religious uh, objection to a certain law, you know, what, 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 what counts as religious practice, what counts as religious freedom. Uh, and I think that this is, um, I don't know when the best time to get into this would be, but I think this clearly corresponds to your argument about uh, dignitatis humanae and the, uh, the only way that the state actually can be expected to res respect religious liberty uh, as found in dignitatis humanae being at least implicitly to recognize that the Catholic view of what is religion is true. Um, I'm not sure when when we should get into that. Well, but, uh, sure, sure. Let's, let's, let's head towards Dignitas Humanae because I think we've now got a, a rough idea of, 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 of Leo XIII's general conception of church-state relations. It involves an ordered harmony where uh, the state has its own sovereign authority in civil matters but where it's got to privilege through the legal system, it's got to recognise religious truth, including revealed religious truth, and privilege revealed religious truth in the laws. So it, 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 within the bounds of prudence, it should, for example, try and restrict false religious teaching uh, uh, and support and encourage true religious teaching. And he's very explicit about that in Libertas. Um, uh, and this is... This is to, for the good of the salvation of the souls of the citizens of the state. And the state does this, obviously, as the church's agent, because the state has no coercive authority of its own in matters to do with salvation, but it should still support salvation. 
Now, if you look at Dignitas Humana, we've got this idea of a right to religious liberty that blocks any state coercion for religious ends. And if you look at the um, discussion at the council, particularly between 1964 and 65, you'll see the uh, drafting commission issues various what are called relationes, which uh, are sort of relations or accounts, which are sorts of interpretative statements that explain the meaning of the declaration to the council fathers. Because a lot of them actually understandably didn't really know what it meant or wanted to have, be better informed before they voted for it or against it. And they say, for example, that if a state restricted any form of religious practice, like, for example, religious teaching or teaching or public proselytization, uh, simply to preserve religious truth, that would be nefas, that would be wrong in terms of the declaration, because the state would be interfering in the order of religion. Now, we, it looks so we then have a complete clash with Leo XIII, because Leo XIII was saying to states, you should um, actually use law to support a religious truth and to make salvation easier and privilege the true religion. It looks as though uh, with Dignitas Humanae, the church is now saying, you know, you shouldn't do that at all. That's nefast, wrong. Um, and you remember all the concordats were sort of being reformed. So, you know, the Spanish government agreed it wouldn't restrict Protestant proselytization anymore and things like that. Uh, um, and there was a huge change in, in, in relations between the church and certain Catholic countries where previously the church had been legally privileged. So what's going on? Now, I generally find in the literature, there are a number of, one's approach tries to bodlerize Leo XIII. They will say, oh, when he attacks license, he says, you should allow people to say anything. And then you find some really nasty thing, like the Jews should be massacred. Right. They say, well, we can prohibit that. Or we should go in for human sacrifice. We can prohibit that. Well, this is clearly bodlerizing what, what, right. what um, Leo is talking about. He's saying religious truth should be privileged as religious truth, just because it's true, and aid salvation. Not simply to prevent uh, nastiness like human sacrifice or, or, or attacks on, on, on Jewish people or other minorities. Right. So that's a bodlerisation. Um, the other thing they often tend to say, uh, Leo XIII was fundamentally a uh, person of his time. He was really worried about moral scepticism and complete religious indifference. And he had a mistaken idea like the 19th century popes had, that unless you privilege the true religion, you would have religious indifferentism. Well, Leo actually clearly discusses at various times how you can get moderate liberalism that isn't indifferentist. Uh, it will recognize there is a true religion. It will just want to avoid privileging it in the public sphere. So he knows that there's that option, mm -hmm. he, but he rejects it for all the reasons we mentioned. Hmm. So, um, or Courtney Murray will say, when he talks about the church's apostas, we don't really need to worry about that. Uh, there's only one apostas, that's the state. Well, clearly that's news to Leo XIII. So you can't bodlerize him. And it does look as though he's saying something very different from Dignitas Humana. Why then did the drafting commission, when they were trying to persuade the council fathers just before the final vote in September 1965, say to the Council Fathers that the declaration is entirely based on Leo XIII's political teaching, which they did. So in September 1965, De Smet um, uh, says this, for the schema, which is the, the, the pretty much the final draft of the declaration before it was finally voted on in November, I think, for the schema redress rests on the traditional doctrine of a distinction between two orders of human life, that is sacred and profane, civil and religious. In modern times, Leo XIII has wonderfully expanded and developed this doctrine, teaching more clearly than ever before that there are two societies and so two legal orders, 
and two, two potestates, two coercive authorities, church and state, each divinely established but in a different way, that is by natural law, the state, and by the positive law of Christ, the revealed law of the New Testament, that's the church. <clears throat> As the nature of religious liberty rests on this distinction of orders, so the distinction provides a means to preserving it against the confusions which history has frequently produced. So they are saying that the declaration on religious liberty is based on Leo XIII, very clearly. So, and then they say, at the same time, and now we're beginning to see what's happening, we are not addressing the authority over the church, over the faith, of the church over the faithful. Mm, yeah. We are not addressing the authority of the church and the order of religion. <clears throat> so, what I think is going on is this. If you, obviously Leo XIII, for the reasons we discussed, wanted the state to unite to the church as a body to the soul and act as the church's authority in religious matters, so act as the church's agent, as agent for the church's authority in religious matters. That's what he thinks is the ideal situation. Supposing that no longer happens, supposing the state is no longer a community of the baptised, as modern states aren't, they clearly aren't. It's not just that the church isn't asking them to be anymore, they clearly aren't. Uh, baptism has nothing to do with your identity as a citizen. Um, it, it has nothing to do with who gets to exercise authority or gets eligible to be voted into office or anything like that anymore. Um, supposing the state is just a chivalrous potestas, just a civil power, without any attachment to the church, it's only going to have that authority that belongs to it, as native to it, in the civil order. It has nothing to do with religion which entirely come, belongs to the church. And then, of course, you and I always have a natural right not to be coerced in any area by someone who lacks authority over us. Right. That's basic. So if the state has no authority in religion, we will have a natural right, not and a pretty absolute natural right, not to be coerced for religious reasons by the state or any other entity exercising authority in the civil order. And they say repeatedly that they're only addressing a civil liberty addressed by authority, uh, exercised by authority in the civil order. So you can see what the, play, the game is. They make the declaration consistent with tradition by just addressing authority in the civil order using the Leo IX juridical framework of the two powers and just ignoring the power of the church. Right. Bingo. And uh, I, I remember hearing your, uh, I think the first time I heard your name was listening to a video of a lecture by uh, William Marshner at Christendom College who summarized some of your, your arguments uh, on uh, religious liberty. And I believe my understanding of what you, one argument you made is that essentially uh, if, if uh, the state's lack of a right to govern matters of religion rests on the idea that religion uh, is not a natural good, uh, but a supernatural one, uh, which transcends the state, uh, then in, in practice, to, to respect religious liberty as laid out by Dignitatis Humanae, the state must recognize the Catholic understanding of religion as a supernatural good. Well, this, this, is a, this is a very central problem with the Declaration. It's not a problem with its teaching of a right to religious liberty. It's a problem to do with the very common assumption made since the Council that because the first part of the Declaration largely relies, it says, I think it uses a phrase like largely relies, or arguments from reason, and then goes on to revelation at the end. It's entirely available to everyone without any reliance and revelation right through. Now, if it's depending on Leo XIII's teaching of the two coercive authorities, one of which depends on the, the positive law of Christ, which is a revealed law, it cannot be true that the declaration is completely independent of revelation. It's dependent on a certain view of religion as no longer a natural good, as it would have been if Christ had never come to us, 
and offered us the supernatural end. But if religion had just been part of a natural worship of God uh, of this earth, then there's no reason why the state should and shouldn't have attended to it and, and made laws concerning it. It's only because religion has been transferred from the natural end and raised to the supernatural end, um, which changes its nature as religion from serving earthly happiness to uh, through the sacraments, taking us to the beatific invasion, that it, it, it is taken away from the uh, authority of the state. But that means that you are unlikely to get a fully secular audience actually buying the declaration in the sense that Catholics understand it, because they won't recognise religion as a supernatural good. They probably actually, if they're really secular, won't recognise it as a good at all, which leads to even worse problems. But they certainly won't recognise it as a supernatural good transcending state authority. That's a specifically Christian view of religion. And it's basic to the declaration. It's basic to the declaration if the committee that drafted it was telling the truth when it addressed the Council Fathers and said it all depends on the 13th. But the, I think there's a big problem here with a lot of post-Vatican II, I would say conservative Catholicism, particularly associated with the journal Communio. Uh, and I know various people are right for that. Uh, but also with, with, with Joseph Ratzinger, because they very often write as if somehow Dignitas Humanae is the product of some truth and reason about the nature of freedom and truth um, uh, that uh, arises in heightened form in relation to religion, but it's nothing to do with revelation. I think Joseph Ratzinger, when he was Pope, gets said in a speech to the German Bundestag, unlike other great religions, Christianity has never proposed a revealed law to the state and to society. That is, it has never proposed a juridical order derived from revelation. Now, that is flat contrary to Leo XIII, and it's flat contrary to the drafting commission that's recommending the declaration to the Council Fathers on the basis of the existence of a revealed law of religion that gives co all coercive authority over religion to the church and takes it away from the state. Right. So one of the things I think it's fair to say is that there's been a, a sort of form of amnesia, specifically in conservative Catholicism, yes. of an academic variety since the Council that wasn't there in September 1965 at all, where they knew all about Leo XIII. Right. And this is why I cover these sorts of things on the podcast, which is primarily an arts and culture podcast. Uh, when I do get into matters of church teaching, it's usually things that where I find, you know, as somebody raised in, you know, uh, a community that very much uh, self-consciously identified as Orthodox, that boy, I, I've, I've never even heard of this before. I, uh, you know, I'm getting most of church teaching, uh, but I'm but I'm missing a few things. Uh, there's a few things that I that I, perhaps are not explicitly contradict, contradicted in my education, but just just left out and very easy to get a wrong impression. Um, before we move on from Dignitatis Humanae, um, is there any sense in reading the drafts or the history of the council that there were certain any parties who wanted to keep the document from explicitly enumerating those previous teachings which it said it was not in conflict with so that it would be very easy to get the impression uh get the wrong impression about what dignitatis humanae was saying because that that's what in fact what in effect happened but i wonder if that was intentional on anybody's part i think it, it kind of was i think look um you, you get this admitted you know under people's breath Here's something that Eve Congar, who, who was involved on the progressive side, um, well-known Dominican theologian, says in a book called La Liberté Religieuse, just after the Council in 1967. Um, Some would have wished that the Declaration had contained a paragraph on liberty in the church. Of course it didn't. They explicitly excluded that. Not only would it have added to motives for opposing the declaration, so he's admitting it. He knew bloody well if they went on to the authority of the church, they'd have real trouble. How about the canon law and heresy? People like the fair did raise that issue. Um, mm. How can heresy be a punishable crime if there's a right to religious liberty? Oh, well, if it's liberty in the civil order, we're not discussing can the canonical issue, are we? Okay. Not only would 
addressing liberty in the church have added to motives for opposing the declaration, bloody well it would have done, not only would have it involved engagement in a delicate question which does not admit of simplification. You can see him sort of, you know, sitting there squirming. Not only would one have added to the pastoral difficulties that the text already brought with it. Yeah, but you discuss the Council of Trent's condemnation of Erasmus and tell us why that's wrong. That would be fun, <laughs> wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> it? It would make the Lefebvre's crisis like like a, like a, like a, a tea party tea party uh, uh, dispute compared to what would have actually have arisen once it was clear mm. that we're going to be addressing and c contradicting Trent. But one would have, again, confused distinct questions, Congar continues. One must not in any account merge questions to do with civil and social liberty and highly complex questions of conduct within the church. That would have been deeply imprudent and dangerous. So I think my answer to your question is, yeah, here, here's an example. Here's an example okay. of someone... Um, well, never, never having read the history of the council, that was my suspicion because, uh, at least as far as that document was concerned, because 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 that's universally the effect that has happened is that that sure. those older teachings have been forgotten through lack of repetition, um, and I think we can probably name three or four other teachings that are that are similar um, uh, in church history. Uh, I mean, the, 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 you can see actually something very important in the whole way the declaration was done that's clearly connected with this issue but it's not usually publicly acknowledged. You know the Declaration began as the final chapter of the Decree and Ecumenism. And it hmm. began in the earlier drafts discussing the question of liberty amongst Christians and then going on to discuss liberty outside the church between Christians and non-Christians and between non-Christians and other non-Christians. And they suddenly decided they weren't going to have it in the Decree of Ecumenism. It's going to be a standalone declaration on liberty in the civil order. Now, we can already right. see why they had to right. do this. Right. Because if you're going to have it in the decree of ecumenism, you are, ecumenism is precisely about relations between uh, Catholics and the Catholic Church and validly baptised non-Catholics, who are all, as baptised, subject to the coercive jurisdiction of the Church by the present code as much as the earlier canon law of the time of Trent. That's why, unfortunately, Protestants could be uh, charged with heresy, uh, whereas Muslims couldn't be at the time of the Reformation because they were baptised. Hobbes hmm. in Leviathan is very funny about this. Um, the, the Pope pretends that all baptised Christians are his subjects, but he leaves the Turks alone because they're not baptised. Well, absolutely. Um, but of course, if you had it as a final chapter in the decree in ecumenism, you would have had to have addressed the coerced yes. authority of the church. Well, they didn't want to do that, did they? That's that's were, absolutely fascinating. That's that's fascinating. But they won't admit um, that, but it's clear if you read yeah. Congar, obviously. So there is an element of dodge to the whole thing, I have to say. Okay. Um, wow. So uh, let's uh, let's conclude with the the final topic of <clears throat> uh, freedom of speech, freedom of opinion. I've I've read a number of. Uh, passages from various encyclicals of the 19th century on this topic. I, I believe in uh, Mirari Vos, there's one as well. Um, but he, he addresses it here in Immortale Dei, and uh, he has a couple of paragraphs on free speech. Uh, in some ways, uh, just as an aside, I think even more than the teaching on the confessional state, uh, this is the one that that has the most immediate contradiction, perhaps, with the U.S. Constitution, because after all, Leo allows for situations where it may not be prudent uh, for the state to, uh, you know, be a full, fully confessional state. But uh, this free speech thing, I believe, uh, aside from matters of heresy, uh, is more a more a matter of the natural law. Um, so this this could be a real problem unless you allow for you know the state's ability to enforce to regulate these things even if the federal government doesn't. But anyway, so uh, let me read this passage. Uh, I think this is the the second passage on free speech in uh, Immortale Day. The liberty of thinking and of publishing whatsoever each one likes without any hindrance is not in itself an advantage over which society can wisely rejoice. On the contrary, it is the fountainhead and origin of many evils, 
I'm moving ahead a little bit. If the mind assents to false opinions and the will chooses and follows after what is wrong, neither can attain its native fullness, but, mo but both must fall from their native dignity into an abyss of corruption. Whatever, therefore, is opposed to virtue and truth may not rightly be brought temptingly before the eye of man, much less sanctioned by the favor and protection of the law. Yeah, this is not this is not how one normally understands things within the United States. I think, um, I think. Look, the the declaration, which obviously is concerning religious liberty, is quite hot on the importance of people attaining the truth without being disturbed by coercion. And you have in Leo the Thirteenth what's clearly a very different attitude, which actually coercion has a legitimate use to uh, prevent people being seduced by error. So we limit uh, you know, what can be published, what can be taught in schools, uh, 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 what people even can say in public places. Um, and that obviously is, is, is so illiberal, it seems to us now. Now, the Declaration is obviously specifically ruling out interference in expression religious matters in the civil order and we've already got a story about why that would apply. It's interesting that even the declaration though emphasizes that the uh, there is an exception the state can interfere in religious liberty uh, by implication including with speech and inquiry if necessary to preserve just public order which, of course, they very carefully insist doesn't involve a specifically religious good, but it involves the civil order uh, uh, that the state is supposed to be protecting. But, of course, there is an analogy here. We could look at heresy laws or apostasy laws as uh, protecting the equivalent of just public order within the community of the church. The good of the community of the church depends on uh, committed faith. Um, and people just treat the faith as something you can say anything about whatsoever or just walk about, away from when you feel like it without any kind of penalty, then the community of the church may not survive. That's a better way of looking at it. And obviously, Dignitas Humanis says nothing about that because it's not addressing the community of the church. But there is an issue to do with coercive authority in general, which the rather liberal rhetoric of the Declaration and natural liberal understanding that you might get looking at the American Constitution or at uh, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty or things like that. There is a whole set of questions about restriction of speech and expression which raise quite issues about the nature of coercive authority as such. Nowadays we tend, if we're brought up as liberals, as we all have been, you and I were both probably taught all this stuff in various ways, John Stuart Mill and the rest, to think that what what coercive authority are about is about protecting various kinds of external attack, uh, like theft and misapplication of taxation, denial of goods that we might otherwise have needed, uh, interference with property, attacks on the person, all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's quite wrong for coercive authority to bother itself with what goes on in our heads. So. Um, Curse authority is about regulating external goods of a vital nature. That's really what it's about. If you look at Aristotle or medieval Catholic political theory, it's very clear that what coercive authority, including the authority of the state, is about, is about preserving, uh, amongst other things, uh, not just uh, uh, virtue in the public sphere, but a community related to that, a community of shared ethical belief. And so the coercive authority is, is, is a teacher and it uses threats of punishment to get the right ideas into people's heads, partly by direct, using threats of punishment to direct their attention to arguments they might not have been attending to. So you know, threats of punishment for theft are about other things besides just stopping you actually stealing. They're also about getting you to understand the value of property rights. Right. Obviously, actually, that must be right. Uh, if people refrain from theft simply to avoid the penalties, just as penalties, you'd have to have an amazingly large police service. You want most people to refrain from theft because they believe in proper and respect property rights. Right. Now, um, 
in that context, all states are actually in the business of using coercive penalties to dictate the nature of people's beliefs. And that's why um, you'll notice that, for example, very few states, I think, tolerate for any length of time serious public pluralism about family structure. They don't restrict free expression directly through speech laws, and they probably won't, they won't do that. They will use their links with other institutions of civil society, like the university system and who gets grants, etc., to shut various things down. Hmm. I remember going to another British university and asking, would it be all right? Uh, I was at a friend's inaugural lecture, and I said, oh, look, I'm, I'm a professor of moral philosophy. Would it be all right if I gave a lect series of lectures in your university discussing various possible forms of family structure and having discussed all the you know, alternatives, gay relationships, polygamy, you name it, <clears throat> that works, um, I suddenly said, look, here's some arguments for why uh, natural law, heterosexual monogamy is the right family structure. Could I do that? And I've, I've, I've done it with all the arguments. I'm giving everyone a fair view of all the, of the debate. And they said, no, we'd have to shut you down. The head of the School of Humanities of this university, who'd had a bit to drink by this stage, um, was rather frank, said, of course we'd shut you down. Gosh, but we can't let you do that. Any more than the 19th century, I could have done a course in, gay in favour of gay marriage at a Victorian university. I'd have been shut right. down. Right, right. So all, and, I, and I'm, to be honest, I think the same would be true in the United States, you know, is the First Amendment notwithstanding, you know, pressure would have been broad. So uh, all these societies use various forms of coercive authority and its links with the rest of civil society to control opinion in certain area, vital areas of human life. And it seems to me that someone like Leo XIII is much more realistic about this sure, yeah. than, than people are now. And, and there, there isn't really such a thing as a liberal state, if you mean by that a state that doesn't do that. The only difference is states that admit they do it and states that do it without admitting that they do it. That's right. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think we can say at the, at the very least, you know, you, you can't permit, uh, it's madness for a state to permit speech that goes against the very existence of, of society. So I think, I think that, uh, I think that according to church teaching on the on, uh, on freedom of opinion i think that the, the writings of karl marx just to use a really obvious example would would have to be banned and i you know i've discussed these things with some some good good people who tend to be a little bit more of the neoconservative or whatever you want to call it bent and and they'll say well they'll kind of dismiss and say well the church doesn't have an index anymore well that's not really a serious objection i mean we haven't had an avignon papacy too but uh, you know, to assume that now we're in this new paradigm where the church can no longer ever, you know, the, you know, much less the state, the church itself is no longer going to list books and 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 uh, threaten the faithful with punishments if they read them for their own good. Um, that's not a serious argument to simply say, well, at this moment we don't have a we don't have an index. I no. mean, uh, we're, we're well. Here's, here's an analogy. Let, let, Leaving Marx aside, he has too many supporters in, in, in most uh, elite, uh, secular elites to, uh, or sympathisers to, 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 to ban him successfully. But take, take someone less loved, that possibly uh, 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 comparable in certain respects. I take our old friend Adolf. I went and opened up a booth in a, city in, a street in a city in Germany to sell copies of Mein Kampf. I would be shut down pronto. That's right. Uh, to be honest, I think I would, that would happen if I did it in Oxford Street in London, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and as we know, in Germany, there are Holocaust denial laws. It can be a crime to go around denying the Holocaust has <coughs> happened. That's right. Now, I don't criticise these laws at all. They're very understandable. But that shows you that any state, and of course in Germany, for very good reasons, they're particularly worried about events in the mid-20th century and never want that repeated. Any right. state will prevent what would now be called forms of, of hate ste speech and publication. There'll be local cultural, you know, barriers to doing it one way or another, but we're just discussing, uh, we're just discussing the boundaries, not the principle. Just to go back to the intersection of this teaching on freedom of opinion, freedom of publication with 
uh, the uh, the state aging uh, acting as an agent uh, for the enforcement of, of church laws. Uh, is there a conflict between Dignitatis Humanae and uh, would would Dignitatis Humanae allow preventing non Catholics to proselytize? Is that is that something that would be uh, would be allowed by a dignitatis humanae. What what constitutes it, free a free uh, free practice of religion? Because for many religions, proselytization is considered to be part of the practice of religion. Now, dignitatis humanae it itself says this is not absolute. Uh, even even in that, I, I it think, says it's not right. absolute. I think I think it would prohibit banning proselytization for specifically religious ground reasons. So you couldn't ban someone from proselytizing simply because their religion was false. Okay. If, on the other hand, as part of their religion, they propose to go in for infant sacrifice, then you'd have a threat to just public order because you'd have a threat to an element of the civil order as, 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 as guarded in a way not directly involving the good of religion uh, by natural law. Um, of course, before Vatican II, uh, many of these non-Catholic groups might not be baptised but you could still restrict them because the jurisdiction of the church has historically been understood to take two forms, direct and indirect. Uh, another term for indirect is defensive. And so the church can't, for example, force unbaptized Jews to become Catholics uh, or to become baptized Christians, but it can use coercive power to the extent it has it, through the state, Christian state it might well have it, to keep non-baptized religious groups from interfering in the internal life of the community of the baptized through proselytization for example and so you would have rules uh, restricting Jew jewish or islamic proselytization through the indirect co uh, jurisdiction of the church um, but i don't think it, after dignity started Simone, you can't do that uh, mm -hmm. not, you'd have to have some more something more to say than just the religion is false is there, uh, how does that sit with previous previous church teaching or laws on on that topic, especially to do with Christian heresies? Well, it's quite well. It's quite well. Christian heresy again is is that's the baptized, and then then you in principle you could actually get quite coercive to them because uh, if they were culpably heretical, and I, the cul word culpable was always been very important because this is a punishment, not just mechanical pressure. They were culpably heretical, um, at, as baptized. Then the fact that they weren't Catholics wouldn't necessarily protect them, which is precisely why one of the principal means to re-Catholicize formerly Catholic areas of Europe that had gone Protestant was coercive. Um, one should, you know, have no illusions about this being true in the 16th and 17th centuries. It becomes to be seen as extremely imprudent. <laughs> By the 18th century, and abandoned because actually, in many ways, it's it, it has lots of bad effects. But there's also the issue of uh, how you coerce the act of belief, which we raised at the very beginning. You can't accept the faith against your will. You can't believe something against your will. We got to believe something against your will in an area where you have the power of freedom. Of course, what coercion could so, for example. I mean, to take a disgraceful thing that happened and was condemned by the Vatican in the Second World War, you've got Cro Croats taking Eastern Orthodox in Serbia or Serb-inhabited areas of Croatia and threatening them with death if they didn't become Catholics. This is under mm -hmm. the Astarchy, you know. That was condemned by Rome. It was very, very wrong. But, <clears throat> of course, it gets complicated and I'm certainly not defending the old coercive passage methods, which weren't quite like that. What you did when you did coerce the baptized, you didn't sort of take them screaming into the church and say, "Ah, you know, we're going to we're going we're going to uh, uh, enroll you as a Catholic." What you would do is you would put pressure on them to change their will. So in the end, they weren't converted against their will. Their will was informed by coercive pressure, so it changed. 
That's what and we're talking but, about. People who are baptized, so they are capable of making the act of faith. They have the the access it, to the supernatural graces necessary to do yeah. this. And we we would so what the Habsburgs did in um, you've got to remember much of Austria, not just Bohemia, but much of Austria, uh, Upper Lower Austria were Protestant by about the late 16th century. They they once they realised that pr uh, Protestantism is a security risk, you know, Thirty Years' War and all that. Uh, they become very much more coercive. Um, and they start saying to the Protestant burghers and nobility of Austria, uh, Federösterreich in what's now Baden, and, and of course the, the Protestant Czech nobility in Bohemia, well, I'm afraid, guys, you better convert, otherwise we're taking your estates away. You won't have any land. Um, and this obviously had an effect on some people. Now, that's <laughs> pressure to change your will. And it's the use of coercive pressure to direct your attention to the church, the case, the, the case the church is making for itself. Now, we wouldn't do that. It's not forcing someone to become a Catholic at a time when their will opposes it. It's the use of coercive pressure to change their will into becoming willing. Just as the way the law changes my will into becoming unwilling to, to steal by informing me of the importance of property rights. Now, this is all very controversial. It's not addressed sure. in Dignitas Simone, but it's, right. it was very much endorsed by the church in the 16th century. Right. And Leo himself, you know, we've been talking about this, uh, but, uh, <clears throat> but Leo himself is not really focused on this no. so much. Uh, he's more talking about the, the church favoring the state um, and... Uh, and uh, the state favoring you know, the church. Th yeah. things like that. Yes, sorry. Yeah, the state favoring yeah, yeah. the church. And uh, in you know, an example would be sort of uh, subsidizing Catholic education, or you know, making sure that the church is not forced to pay taxes, or you know, th things like that. Um, or or, you know, or restricting public. You can't have a Protestant bookshop in a, in a Spanish town under Franco. You know that sort of thing. Uh, right. You, you, you can't. You can't. You can't have a Protestant Truth Society right. in Segovia when General Franco is in charge. Uh, um, British Foreign Office used to be very cross about this. Anthony Eden mm -hmm. used to create about how unfair this was, and we, we, it was, it was a huge amount of pressure at the time of Vatican II on the Church to detach herself from this use of the state. It was. It, it, yeah. it, you've got to remember before Dignitas Humanae's passed, Paul VI is due to speak at the United Nations. They really, really want this declaration through. Yeah, they're desperate. I'm, uh, I'm imagining my poor audience at this moment, uh, and uh, I, 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 I believe they all they want to, uh, you know, be faithful to church teaching in every way. Um, but I know it's it. This is these are some difficult uh, things to swallow, you know, uh, in you know, growing up in the time and place that we do. Uh, so just to offer an encouraging word, I, I always find that simply trusting the church, uh, it never leads you to a place of, uh, you know, tyranny or, or cruelty or, um, madness. Uh, I, I, I found that it served me well to, to trust the church and to set aside my own ideological tendencies, uh, and, and listen to the church's teaching as well, um, uh, I mean, uh, instead, uh, so I, I think that uh, you know the gain from being docile is always always greater. Um, obviously, everybody has to go through their own process and read the documents and sort of, you know, f come to their conclusion. And and uh, if they aren't convinced by what we've what we've said here, um, but uh, it is important. It, it it is important, and it's important to know what the church teachings are, even. Uh, in situations where it might be difficult to apply them in our present political environment, because it does bear on our whole conception of the created order in its relationship to God and its relationship to religious truth. And it, and it bears on, um, you know, it, it really bears on, uh, you know, frankly, this is a podcast about arts and culture. It bears on beauty, you know, it bears on the the beauty and the harmony of the created order. And, uh, and so we don't have this kind of uh, fragmented, compartmentalized world of, of church and state. They are distinguished in their proper spheres, but they work together in harmony. Um, and uh, I'd also like to, to, to give an encouraging word from Leo. Uh, he wrote a letter to the, the bishops 
of the United States called Longinqua. Um, and uh, early in the letter, he praises uh, the tolerance uh, of American society towards the Catholic Church. He says, thanks are due to the equity of the laws which obtain in America and to the customs of the well-ordered republic. For the church amongst you, unopposed by the constitution and government of your nature, nation, fettered by no hostile legislation, protected against violence by the common laws and the impartiality of the tribunals, is free to live and act without hindrance. Yet, though all this is true, it would be very erroneous to draw the conclusion that in America is to be sought the type of the most desirable status of the church, or that it would be universally lawful or expedient for state and church to be, as in America, dissevered and divorced. The fact that Catholicity with you is in good condition, nay, is even enjoying a prosperous growth, is by all means to be attributed to the, fecund to the fecundity with which God has endowed his church, in virtue of which, unless men or circumstances interfere, she spontaneously expands and propagates herself. But she would bring forth more abundant fruits if, in addition to liberty, she enjoyed the favor of the laws and the patronage of the public authority. I wanted to read that because... First, to encourage, you know, so some uh, American Catholics who may be feeling a little battered or a little bit disoriented in, well, how can I possibly be a, a patriotic Ameri American uh, and believe these church teachings? Um, and I think that I think that this is a crisis for a lot of people. And I also wanted to say that as a corrective to those, you know, being on Twitter, I see a lot of traditionalists and and, and inter some integralists who think that we really have to repudiate the founding entirely, um, or even more than that, simply repudiate being an American, being a loyal American citizen. Um, I think, I think uh, Brandon McGinley uh, has well put it that, you know, being patriotic, you don't have to be patriotic on the terms set by your government or by your political establishment. And that's true. The nation is more than its political establishment. But... Even so, I think Leo's approach shows that you can have a, a generally positive uh, and and admiring approach to the American founding and the Constitution in in many respects, while still wanting to correct uh, correct it on a couple of points. Uh, they're not minor points. It's also understandable why the founders came to these conclusions historically. Um, I I don't think that we we have to have no pride in our uh, our American uh, polity in order to embrace these teachings. And I think, I think that Leo has done us a kindness still in, in writing in this way uh, so that we, we don't become discouraged. He, he wrote primarily to, in, to encourage and, and reinforce and, uh, and strengthen the church in America. Um, and that's not done by inducing panic, depression, and and despair. <laughs> um, no, and if, if, if I can add, Thomas, he also, in a way, he might not have liked the project behind it, but he gave us Dignitatis Humanae, which is probably one of the last major exercises in Leonine political theology in the history <laughs> of the church. Ah, how about that? According yeah. to the drafting commission. Uh, any closing words? Do you have, do you have anything... Uh... You want to well, say only one other thought. I, I mean, I think one has to be respectful of church teaching. Absolutely, that's fundamental to being Catholic. But one can also shouldn't dwell in a timeless present. I think one of the big problems we face at the moment and have done in the last 40 years is that um, there is a tendency to use uh, what uh, ecclesial authorities might say today as to be something you look at in complete abstraction for what they might have said in the past. But the popes of the past were just as much popes as the popes of the present. And if there are apparent inconsistencies, one, one can't just disregard them, one has to reconcile them and try and form right. a more general view. Because otherwise you're just pretending the papacy began yesterday, which it didn't. And it works in both directions. It's not for us to simply dismiss a modern magisterial or, uh, or conciliar, conciliar pronouncement because it appears inconsistent to us. Uh, the, we, we must we must uh, assume that uh, that they can be rec reconciled. 
um, even if even if perhaps in the future the language might be tweaked or or refined so that it's easier to see how they're consistent. Um, I can certainly see that happening. Um, but uh, uh, the, the proper approach is not simply to dismiss uh, uh, what we what we think is inconsistent if it, if yeah, it is truly sure. magisterial. Um, yeah. So 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 it works in both ways. But yes, absolutely. You know, I think uh, um, we can see. We can see this happening on the question of usury. You know, there hasn't been a, uh, well, perhaps, I don't know if Benedict mentioned it in his encyclicals or not, but but Benedict and Francis have both condemned usury, something that people thought was long forgotten and, and uh, no longer a concern of the Catholic Church. So um, while, they ha while they have not sort of defined it precisely, uh, they have condemned it. They have mentioned it as a bad thing. And I think, you know, as with... Uh, uh, as with a number of these areas where, you know, late 19th, early 20th century encyclicals and modern teachings seem to be, if not at odds, then uh, the modern teachings seem to simply leave the older teachings out of consideration. I think there will be a, a greater synthesis. But right now, we, we simply have to do a little bit more work than perhaps is ideal uh, yeah, to, to put all these things together for ourselves because we don't have a... Uh, summa that's doing it for us yeah. no that that will be the future <laughs> thanks so thanks thomas so much for, for having me on uh thomas it's yeah really, it's been really... delight it's been a delight speaking with you um and uh, i'm so glad to uh have covered this topic so thoroughly and uh to, to those who stuck with us for almost two hours thank you for listening god bless you um, and uh, I believe the next episode after this will be a discussion of uh, the history of the temptation of St. Anthony in art, in, in the visual arts with uh, Catholic art historian Elizabeth Lev, which, which should be a very uh, fun episode. That'll probably come out a little bit after Halloween, but we'll, we'll call it a Halloween episode. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you.